Did you know that in 2021, an Ariana Grande cloud perfume was sold every 11 seconds? That's unreal. Uh, unreal. And that is according to the Zoe report. That is 7,854 perfume bottles a day, 54,982 per week, 238,254 per month, or 2,859,050. You guys get it. I'll have it on the screen. <laughs> per year with an average price of around $50 between the bottle sizes that puts the average yearly sales at 142,952,727 dollars that year and that is only one of the 14 cents so that's just over a billion a year yes <laughs> it is because this of course is the number before subtracting like the cost of manufacturing yeah. and shipping and returns but 143 million dollars a year for one of your 14 products is not bad i'm yeah i think you're doing pretty well and it's it's wild to me that it's also perfume because it's not like a pack of gum or like where people have to buy an energy drink that day. is something that's really interesting like why perfume specific like the, when you were like every 11 seconds i was like who needs that much my little Perfect. sister <laughs> my little yeah. sister needs one for hers she i put some on this morning it's coconut and marshmallow smell which you wouldn't think i don't like coconut stuff but there's okay. something about this cloud perfume and my little sister like every year i buy her different perfumes for christmas mm -hmm. and she just only uses the cloud perfume and so i just buy her multiple she gets multiple she has one in her school backpack in her car in her bedroom like in her like her old volleyball bag she just has to smell yeah. like ariana grande cloud and um refinery 29 reported that ariana grande made 150 million dollars from her perfume line in 2017 and that was a year before she even came out with the cloud perfume so she Whoa. was already making this from the other scents the cloud was created in 2018 it's one of Ulta's top selling and top rated products. And Vogue referred to Ariana Grande as a perfume tycoon in 2023. And they estimated that her global perfume sales have surpassed $1 billion. Wow. It's so fascinating how artists really only become billionaires from businesses. Yeah. Like you think of Ariana Grande, Cloud Perfume, you think Rihanna with Fenty. Skin, even Kim Kardashian with like skims and stuff. It's so interesting how what they're known for is not always what like the generates the most business or, right. or dollars and cents too is even interesting and how like there's like this meta game developing yeah. of like building an audience and then how do you like funnel that audience into like a product yeah. is really like the world we're headed to even for creators I think like that's so really true. like the next frontier of this so true and and I think you're spot on and I think we're seeing this like race the last couple years of celebrities really trying to create their brand like I think a lot of people saw the success of things like Kylie Cosmetics and mm -hmm. were like where do we get that and kind of the premise of this episode is going to be so many people break break down and analyze and talk about celebrity makeup lines celebrity skincare lines but there's this silent like industry that no one talks about that's worth more than all of those combined and it's the perfume industry yeah so we're gonna talk about that it was inspired to by kylie jenner launching a new perfume cosmic so i thought it was the perfect time to talk about this and then we're also going to go into a couple other things um we want to talk about briefly about the rise of tara yummy because mm. we got a shout out recently who would have thought i know trevi moran we love, love trevi um, they were, they mentioned me and Nikki in the first, like, few, like literally I was, um, watching the Tara Yummy interview with Trevi Moran on YouTube this morning, getting ready. And in like the first five seconds, Trevi says to Tara, um, you know, on the podcast with Nikki and Coco Moco, they say it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. Yeah. I, so, yeah. I love that. That's like, a, a narrative that has become known from like. I this know. spreading and the word. I know it's not like we didn't even come up with the quote. I I yeah. truly don't remember where I heard her. I think it was I heard it from Z Way. <laughs> yeah. The first, but she didn't. But she was quoting someone else even saying it. But it's such a beautiful 
it's just a beautiful line and it's so true. Yeah. Like time and time again, you see, and now with the Oscars coming this weekend, mm-hmm. I love, there's always so many great Where's stories it? about like why it takes 10 years to become an overnight yeah. success. I love that. Yeah. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Maybe a love is blind recap because you guys really liked talking about that one on, um, over on TikTok. And with all of that being said, Hi, I'm Kokomoka. I'm Nikki. And this is the Share Your Screen podcast. I thank you guys so much for watching. As always, the subscriptions help us. Um, if you hit subscribe, I made it sound like it was like you're like getting a magazine. If you hit subscribe on YouTube, um, you'll be notified of our videos and leaving reviews on Spotify, Google, Apple, Please. all helps us. It helps us chase a dream, baby. Yeah, and we are probably going to be doing more interviews with Spotify again because everyone loved it. So. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are yeah, running we up, are. running up. You already know. If you haven't seen the first one, go and watch it. We interviewed the head of editorial content mm-hmm. for all of music. If you have, if you've ever wanted to work in music, if you're a music artist yourself, or if you're just fascinated with pop culture and how these yeah. people have these rises, who better to ask and listen to talk yeah. than the person who is the head of the entirety of Spotify editorial? It was such a fascinating interview, and we're excited to do a, a part two. Yeah, so that will be also exciting. Let us know in the comments on YouTube. Um, Or in the Discord, if you guys have questions, if you're an artist, if you manage artists and you're like, you know, how do we get our music out there? How do we grow on Spotify? Those are all questions that we'll be asking the people at Spotify, um, which is really cool. So we're going to get into the perfume um, for the first half of this episode. And I'm going to talk about um, and get Nikki's reaction throughout. First off, just like the history of celebrity perfumes. Mm-hmm. So according to Jezebel.com, Sophia Loren um, was a film star, an old Hollywood film star. And it is thought that she was the first kind of like celebrity to launch a celebrity perfume as we know them today in 1981. And then the first big success that the first celebrity perfume line that would go on to be worth over a billion dollars was Elizabeth Taylor's White Diamond Perfume, which launched in 1991. Um, Even to this day, one bottle is sold every 15 seconds, according to Dazed. Yeah. It's crazy to think about how often people buy fragrances. I think it's, I don't think it's an American thing. I think Mm. it's like a European thing or like, I think it's not as prominent here. It is, but like, or if you've ever, have you seen that one guy on TikTok called Jeremy Fragrance? He is, he's the epitome of the niche you go, the quicker you grow. All (laughs) he does is 8 million followers, talks about perfumes. And it's so crazy. What happens in his videos is he's in Europe somewhere. Mm -hmm. And like, um, he mainly talks about cologne. So like, teenagers or like young guys will like run up to him and they'll, they'll recognize him they're like oh my god hi can you guess my perfume he literally will smell them and he'll be like ysl blah 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 like 1991 like he knows that's impressive i know it's actually like like that's not like a normal no human imagine trait. having an acute sense in like any at anything like i couldn't tell I you the difference between a mcdonald's cheeseburger and like anything else so like, and like you, you know can. what i mean yeah. but like some people are like it has nodes of cinnamon and paprika and aged tobacco in. and aged in this barrel i know huh huh know. i'm like i thought the packaging was cute literally that's all i know literally. um so yeah it's it's just so fascinating there's like a whole industry out there and i i think i think it is partly like I think maybe in America it's just not as big. Um, someone in our Discord, I believe, or no, we in the video last week, the Dune video, when we mentioned wanting to talk about celebrity perfumes, one of the comments on that video was someone saying that they know it sounds crazy, but they know people um, growing up who didn't know Britney Spears from their music, but knew Britney Spears from her perfume line. I didn't even know she had a perfume line. That's I know, fascinating. And we'll get into that. It was big in the early 2000s. Interesting. I'm also starting to kind of like paint a mental picture of like who has a successful perfume line. Because I think yeah. that the, it is really this like very bubblegum, hyper feminine pop girl that does well you know because what's interesting like celebrity makeup makes sense because we look at them a lot right like you see them in a magazine you see them in a music video you see them in a photo shoot whatever so like you want to look like them therefore you apply the same makeup techniques same makeup products whatever but like a fragrance is interesting to me because you can't smell them from a magazine or like a music video so it's like an idea of I guess what you think they would smell like but I think when you think of like an Ariana or a Britney Spears, it does make sense to have like a 
coconut cloud or yeah. like a very sweet smelling yeah. thing for like this very young female audience. I don't know. It's just interesting to think about how there's no actual like tie no. between like the person and the product, just kind of like an idea of who they are. Yeah. And I think like my theory on why celebrity perfumes, because you asked such a good question, why they're like this billion dollar empire that no one talks about. I think perfumes are a low barrier to entry um, mm. thing to buy. They usually cost a lot of money and you don't have to get the correct shade. You don't have to get the right size clothing. It can't look bad on camera. Yeah. So if you come out with a clothing line like Kylie Jenner's Kai, part of the problem she's having is people try on the items and if they don't look good mm -hmm. on the person, yeah. It's gonna deter. No one can like smell something through yeah. a video, so you kind of just believe. They can't do a bad try on haul of your perfume. You can't do a bad try on haul of a perfume. All, you awesome. have to get the packaging right and the story right, and it's also a low barrier to entry in terms of gift giving. Mm -hmm. Like if a boyfriend is looking for someone or a mom is looking for someone, they might not know the right shade of Charlotte Tilbury lipstick. Right. But they can get them a perfume and it's gonna it's one size fits all. Right. I also think it's a lifelong customer business. Mm. Like if your skin changes for makeup as you age, your yes. body changes as you Clothing. age. But like you can have a signature scent and wear it for a decade. And there are some people who do that where they have like a signature scent that they wear for years. Yeah. So it's like if you get somebody in, then really? they can wear it when they're 20, they can wear it when they're 30, they can wear it when they're 50. That's so true. I think that's like what it is and the um early 2000s now are really known as like this golden age when it came to celebrity perfume lines you had things like britney spears curious j-lo's glow taylor swift had one called wonderstruck and this specifically in terms of packaging for perfumes was a time that was known as maximalism. Mm -hmm. um, so it was all these like hot pink bottles yeah. and glitter on the yep. bottles. Yep. And the scents were known for being very fruity and sugary. And um, this might be before your time, but if you ever got like a 17 magazine or a Vogue magazine, like a physical, which I've been collecting some, I buy them on eBay. Let me know what um, magazines you guys think I should get next. But uh, when you open some of the pages, they would have this thing that like folds out and they would have some of the scent oh, like cool. smudged into the paper. So you unfold it and then you smell the paper and you know what I miss paper. print media so much. Can we bring it back? We need to bring it back. I love just having like a physical uh okay interview magazine they did um a cover with lana del rey the one where she's smoking a cigarette mm -hmm. outside the chapel mm -hmm. i've been collecting magazines and i wanted to get the interview magazine for lana del rey last year it's going for like 300 something dollars on ebay that's you can't crazy. even get it like it's so expensive and I get scared to like buy things on eBay because I've bought old 17 magazines on eBay from like 2007 and the people like they've obviously ripped out the best mm. pages and I'm like, Ugh. but I think it'd be so cool in our pop culture museum to yeah. have like a wall of like the best magazine covers through the world. Like oh, throughout yeah. time. Oh yeah, for sure. I would love that. Um, so there was, so it was really known for maximalism. Um, and then the celebrity perfume craze slowed down around like, 2008-ish, mid-2010s, which could be the result of the financial downturn, the recession mm -hmm. mixed with the rise of social media, because back then some of the theories were that the reason people bought perfumes um, of celebrities was because it was some a way to feel close to the celebrity, Yeah, because they would only see a few interviews of them every now and then, or a video. But if you bought the perfume, you smell like them every day, yeah. or you thought you did, and with the rise of like social media, it kind of pacified people in a new way mm -hmm. when it came to that interpersonal relationship. But I also don't think that theory is necessarily true because if social media was this new pacifier, Ariana Grande wouldn't have a billion dollar perfume industry in the 2020s. So I don't know that their theory is completely true. I think there was a compounding of factors. Now, the top 10 celebrity perfumes of the early 2000s, according to a 2011 Forbes article, also take this with a grain of salt because Paris Hilton wasn't on this list and she's like, we'll get into her. Okay. She is a perfume tycoon. Interesting. So at number 10, Reese Witherspoon, her, it was called In Bloom and it made $12 million. Okay. 
I don't also, this article has been like archived. I don't know if it was annually over time. So just again, take it with a grain of salt. Number nine, JLo, Glow, $12 million. Number eight, Usher, Usher for Men, $16 million. Usher had a fragrance. Yes. I think more men should get into fragrance. And we'll oh, get into that. Oh, it's such a good market. And we'll get into I'll that. I'll volunteer. There we go. I'll volunteer. Gwen Stefani, Harajuku Lovers, $18 million. Jessica Simpson, Fancy, $18 million. We could do a whole episode on the entrepreneurship of Jessica Simpson. I would love to because she had the best products. Really? I also think we could do one on Reese Witherspoon. Reese oh, Witherspoon's business The book is club genius. to movie pipeline. It's so good. It's like one of the smartest things I've ever seen. Yeah. I'll do a Jessica Simpson episode and then you'll do a Reese one. Because I think should. Jessica Simpson was also slightly before your time. Yeah. At number five, Sarah Jessica Parker, New York City, 18 million. Also, it's that's a, a smart s- one. A smart one. Because she's like New York City. Yeah. Like number four, Diddy. And I'm not going to get into this, but I'm just going to say the name is very ironic of the cologne that he was selling. It was called Unforgivable. We'll just leave it at that. 18 million. <laughs> Next. <laughs> moving on. Um, number three, Beyonce, Heat. 21 million at number two you would never guess it Derek Jeter I had to look up who that is he's a baseball player player. uh it was called driven and it made 27 million dollars random but shout out Derek Jeter and at number one Elizabeth Taylor white diamonds 54 million dollars so that's just like in a again I feel like they were missing some names but that is just going to lead me now into Paris Hilton, and then I'll talk about the new wave. So Paris Hilton began releasing perfumes and colognes in 2004. She really capitalized on like, I felt like she had this window of fame mm-hmm. and her ability to really strike when things are hot, I think is why she's been famous for over 20 years. I also think it's because she's associated herself with this like very specific decade and look of that yeah. like early 2000s Y2K time. Mm-hmm. And what you always say, the opposite of trendy is timeless. Yeah. So because she has associated herself with this like, like being an icon of the past, yes. it's like she can never fall yes. out of fashion because it's like, yeah. well, I was the peak of this era and that's all I care about. Yes. She's like Marilyn Monroe in like the 50s. Yes. And 60s. Yeah. Yes. In 2016, she came out with the iconic silhouette design for a bottle, which was called Gold Rush, which is a bestseller according to the website. And according to medium.com, Paris Hilton's perfume line has generated billion in sales since its launch in 2004. That is $125 million per year or over $12 million a month that she's making from perfumes or the sales. Again, not considering all other factors, but that's, that is like unreal. She's doing it all. She's like, she's DJing. She's, she's got, she's selling perfumes. Yes. She's staying in her dad's hotel. Yes. She's, she's, she's everything she's everywhere all at once. All. It like, it's it, her entrepreneurship is like something that needs to be studied. She's also an Aquarius and she's one of those celebrities that, um, sometimes I'll get asked by like brands or people in the back end and they're like, how do you like predict things? How do you predict what's going to be next? And I'm like, Look at what Paris Hilton is doing. <laughs> she is always five years ahead. So like she did like a Roblox concert mm-hmm. years ago. Like she's like, she just knows. She's she on does it. Know. Now we're going to just talk about the new wave and then we'll get into kind of other topics. Let us know in the comments what celebrity perfumes you guys have tried and what you like. I really loved Kim Kardashian used to have this like bottle and it was like her body. Like she like, That's do so you know cool. what I'm talking about? Yep. And I all. Yes. And I always, cause she had some other perfumes that were kind of like, I would say duds maybe, but she, my friends and I in college, when we were like broke college kids on our way, we we're in San Diego state on our way to PB. If anyone knows that area, you have to drive down this freeway and on it, you pass by a mall. Mm-hmm. We would pull over into the mall, walk into an Ulta spray ourselves with Kim Kardashian's perfume, get Leave. back in the car and head to the bar. That was our- I love being in college when like, you were just a creature. Scrappy. Scrappy. Like so scrappy. you're, if someone has a half, half eaten Taco Bell on the table, you're like, that's free dinner. Then you're going to no, go don't. to Target, use your fake ID to get some burnettes. Yeah. And like cram six people in an Uber to like yes. go have a night out. Like I, there's just something about like, you're a survivalist when you're in college. You're not thinking logically. You are, you are a survivalist. You're literally naked and afraid. And I remember like, I 
this is when life was good. And I noticed this is also obviously from a place of privilege, but like when I was in college, my biggest like thing that I would think about was my stress was like, how am I going to garner up six (laughs) dollars so i can like contribute to the uber fund to get to the bar tonight and back literally and we would cram eight of us in an uber and all pay like 250 we'd all venmo someone like 250 yep or you you use your last six dollars on the uber and you get to the bar with no money and you have to like strategize a way to get people to buy you drinks the amount of like danger i would put myself in to get someone to drive me home oh oh my god absolutely there was absolutely why spend twenty dollars when you can risk your life exactly it's just math, babe. Yeah. The new wave of celebrity lines, which I think also is probably inspired by the success of Ariana Grande. Mm-hmm. I mean, whenever people talk about the success of Ariana Grande, obviously they're talking about her artistry and her videos and her acting. No one talks about her perfume and how, like, it's just, she's so good at marketing her perfumes. She aligns them to, like, different eras she's done. So, like, mm-hmm. thank you, next. Like, It's just great. So anyways, in the 2020s, we really saw more specifically Gen Z celebrities begin to explore the perfume world. Charlie D'Amelio launched a perfume called Born Dreamer, which I don't, I think it's still up, but I don't think she promotes it anymore. I don't see it. I know. They're very like, they have a lot of businesses going on. Yeah. I felt like, I think they should have really... They made a mistake early on of not sticking to one product. Right. Like, I think that's what Kylie did really well. Yeah. Was, like, at the beginning was just lips. Like, she grew up, she blew up for having lips. Yeah. She did a thing with lips. There was, like, a Kylie Jenner lip challenge. She starts a lip company. Like, it makes sense. And I feel like a fragrance would have been something that made sense for Charlie. For sure. I think so, too. It was, like, there was too many things. And I, we could also do another episode on that. And I know me and you talked about it a little bit with Selena in the Spotify interview which is uh this phenomenon in marketing called decision paralysis and it's where if a consumer is given too many product choices yeah they actually don't they won't buy anything because they get overwhelmed and right. that's what happened with like um we mentioned it then but like head and shoulders actually spiked in sales when they decided to get rid of all their scents and pull back and they noticed that people started buying it more because they didn't have to think it was just like oh boom got it right or like trader joe's is a business that does this really well too like if you walk into like any grocery store and i don't know you need ketchup there's like eight different brands yeah but at trader joe's if you need ketchup there's it's ketchup and that's it there's no other option don't like it don't yeah exactly and stuff like that i think is is super interesting yeah we could talk about that um And then Billie Eilish has her perfume called Eilish. And then I didn't know this. Addison Rae also created a line of perfumes. And when I was looking it up online, the names are like Happy AF, Chill AF, Effortless AF. I think that Addison Rae, I've always said this, she needs to get into hair products and not focus on all this other stuff. I I mean, I think she needs... I'm talking not about her movies and she's actually really good in this one movie Thanksgiving in terms of her. Like, I think she really tried to also do what the D'Amelio's were doing. where yeah. like throwing a bunch of things at the wall to see what sticks. Yeah. Like she was selling like dolls at one point. <laughs> yeah. And I just think that like, she is so known for her hair totally. and she should lead into that. I think hair would have been, I mean, I do think she's like really trying to do music now. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a good decision. Like yeah. I actually think she has a good runway and the EP, like the way it rolled out and everything was really, really perfect. But I also think like a Charlie or Addison should have started like a leggings company, like oh. something so simple. That's just like, what do you like? high school girls like wear to school leggings or like after soccer practice cheer practice leggings what is they are both known for like dancing and this like movement like it's so easy to show like the quality of a product and their ability to move in it by simply just like wearing something like that and i don't know like like something like that just like one product that's like very very high quality it's easy to do it's easy to market um i felt like would have been so genius you're so it's like based in an identity did you see um they've been comments on some videos where they were like charlie should get into like um dance wear like yeah like like what dancers wear and i'm like oh my god that would be so right or even like when the with the coquette theme like really blowing up like she should start like putting bows in her hair and do like ballet flats. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? It like stuff so like that. Sense. Yeah. Like there's so much I think to do with this concept of dance and like the, her going on, um, 
what's the dancing with dance, the stars, thank you. dancing yes. with the stars, showed that like she really is like is a talented performer. Yeah, like she can dance. She that girl can. can dance, and I think she should have leaned into that yeah. more. Yeah, I think so. And also like the discussions around kind of people saying like the downfall of the D'Amelios. What I have to say about that too is like they're also so young. Oh like, my god, they're so. I young. think Charlie's eighteen or nineteen, and I think that we have to give people more grace in their careers as public figures. And like, I always say like, if an influencer gets big at like 16 or whatever doing like, uh, I think of that Ryan's world. He's this kid who does these like toy things. And he's like, he has like a mustache now and his parents are still making him do these like, and you can tell like, there's probably like a disconnect there now. Yeah. And it's like, I think we need to have grace when people try things and also sometimes fail at things because Imagine if you still had to do the job you had at 16. Like my first job was a barista. I couldn't imagine having (laughs) to do that for the rest of my life. If I was so good at it, that that's what I got known for. Or it's people just like with like years of experience comparing like, well, this is what they should have done, which like, yeah, true. There's a lot of things you can talk about in hindsight, Yeah. but also like that's a 16 year old. Right. Or like that's like now an 18 year old who was homeschooled or like, you know what I mean? Like, it, they're, I totally agree with you. They're so yeah. young. They deserve so much more grace. And also, sometimes you don't know. Like, sometimes yeah. life, you got to do stuff before you realize what you're passionate about. Yes. Like, what's wrong with that is I another agree. thing I, I and ask. let them like, fail. Yeah. Like, let them fail. Let them fail, dude. Like, they're the ones who suffer for yeah. it. Like, yeah. if they truly do fail. They're not, like, starting a GoFundMe, GoFundMe and having you fund their adventures, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, if they're not hurting anyone, let them try. Let yeah. people try and, and see what sticks. I agree. This leads us to like Kylie Jenner launched her line cosmic. Um, and I didn't know this, but the shape of the bottle is supposed to be like the palm of a hand, like holding, like sitting in a palm. Of your I didn't, hand. I did not pick that up upon the first glance. I also lie. think Kylie Jenner is in this weird lane, kind of like Olivia Rodrigo, where she can't really do anything creative anymore. Cause it's, someone's going to claim that she's like copied someone and like whether the claims are true or not, I don't know. But Kylie Jenner, I think she's in this place where like she could literally like blink and someone would be like, I blinked first. Like Kylie copied Mm. me. And like, so I think with this perfume bottle, the reason it, when I saw it, I thought it was underwhelming, Mm -hmm. but I think she's afraid to like do anything. Like God forbid she puts like a butterfly on the bottle and people are like, this brand <laughs> like 10 years ago had a butterfly on a perfume I mean, bottle. it's just the space. Like yeah. anything beauty has been done by a hundred other yeah. people and it'll be done by a hundred other people after you. Yes. It's not like a super crate, like even when there is crazy innovation at the end of the day, it's the same product. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, yeah, you might have a, a slightly better formula, but it's still foundation. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's a big problem with yeah. it too. Yeah. You're so right. Like beauty has been done. And same with, um, even like the Hailey Bieber road phone case, which was original thought provoking. Amazing. Yeah. Love that. And I guess there was a brand that did like, a a joke case a while ago where it was like, a bag of wine like on the phone case and it was just like break for emergency but like uh-huh. it, it, it it wasn't and they said that that was usable. copying yeah they were like oh Haley bieber copied this person and i was like it's not even the it's same just the lane concept of attaching something to a phone yeah so like what they all copied pop sockets like what do you mean <laughs> like i just yeah. yeah i just think that like that gets muddy and i think you're right maybe that's why beauty has that conversation a lot wrapping up this perfume conversation is there anything else you want to add could you see any other celebrities getting into it i think like noah beck or like male celebrities i think timothy chalamet would be oh. so good with a fragrance like he needs to do some sort of business or something like that and i feel like he does have this Vibe. And he's he's worked with like I think Prada on fragrances and stuff yes. before too. But he I don't know he has this like sense of like being very uh, I don't know philosophical Genesis and Qua. depth and yes. yeah and like, like I can just see him speaking royal. French in a commercial. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like uh, something like that I think would like yes. really really work. So I could see him doing one. I think Noah Beck's a great yeah. Great I think one. he could be great. Um, and that actually leads me into one of these pop culture topics that I want to talk about that was on the end that I forgot I even added. Did you know that Timothy Chalamet hasn't auditioned for a role in seven years? 
I mean, I would hire him for anything. <laughs> Movies auditioned for him. Last year, rumors were swirling online that Timothy Chalamet was one of the actors who auditioned for the lead in a movie, Gladiator 2, which went to Paul Mescal. Mind you, Irish people are having their moment as an Irish person myself. Chalamet's agent, Brian Swordstrom, tweeted after this rumor was going around. He said, so it wasn't confirmed that he was talking about Timothy, but let's just read between the lines. I know one of these actors was shooting a film in the Middle East for the past seven months, Dune, and he hasn't auditioned for a role in seven years. And this sparked a lot of debate around like, oh, is Timothy just being given roles? But anyway, so then I went through his like movie history on IMDb. His first role was for a movie called Sweet Tooth in 2008 when he was 12. And then, as all New York City actors, I feel like this is a rite of passage, he was in an episode of Law and Order in yeah. 2009 at 13. And then his first reoccurring roles were for two shows in 2012 called Royal Pains and then Homeland. He would have been around 16 at this time. And I think it's interesting that there was maybe this fork in the road where he could have gone the TV show actor route, but mm -hmm. like instead went towards movies after this. And I didn't know this. So he was in interstellar in 2014 yeah. as matthew mcconaughey's son and in his actors on actors interview with emma stone for variety magazine he said that he weeped for an hour after he saw the movie for the first time and it was because that he thought that he had a bigger part Aww. i know and he was embarrassed that he was like so hyped promoting the movie <laughs> alongside names like anne hathaway and then realized he didn't have that big of a part and he just thought like they probably thought he was trying to like steal their thunder and he also said that he was so excited to be in a christopher nolan film because heath ledger as the joker was like one of the reasons he got into acting. And so when he realized how much his part in Interstellar had been cut down, he felt like a fraud, which Aww, is so sad. I know. That is so sad, but I do. I remember in interviews, he said that that role in Interstellar was what got him discovered. Like wow. that role like, was the was the catalyst for yeah. him. So it was like a bad thing ended up being like what opened doors for him. Well, yeah. Not a bad well, I thing, mean, but regardless, like I think his, and he was just like not the main character of the movie and that's fine. Yeah. It's not that it was a bad performance. It's just, he wasn't the pro like he wasn't yeah. the, the biggest piece of the plot. Right. Right. And it's like, even if you think something was a failure, you never know now, like what room your name is floating in because yes. of that. I saw, this is so off topic, but I saw the best TikTok about this yesterday. I'm, I wanted, I'm oh going to make a video about it. Yes. But it was the, God, I can't remember the actor's name from, he's in Abbott, Abbott Elementary. He's yeah, the guy. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, he also played, he Everybody, played Hates Chris. Everybody Hates Chris. Yeah. Yeah. And he was talking about how when uh, they were like first starting to cast Abbott, this was like right after the pandemic, like right when auditions had started to open up and like every actor everywhere was like searching for a bunch of work and he was auditioning for a bunch of other movies and stuff at the time. And Quinta had like messaged him on Instagram and said like, Hey, I'm pitching this show. Um, I want to like bring up a few like thought starter actors for like who I think would pay, play these roles. Are you, are you okay? Are you, are you okay with me bringing my name up? And he was like, sure. Like, uh, yeah, sure. Aww. And um, later on, he like the show ends up like getting approved and he like starts to be in like the later audition process for some of these larger movies. But she he's like, I don't know, like something I just felt like like she had said that like she wrote this part for me. Like I was the actor in mind she had when when writing this part. And um, so he ended up taking it and obviously like completely changed Change his, his life. life. And, and like the takeaway from this video is he was like, even when you're at your lowest low, there is somebody out there who is building something for you that is going to change your life and they don't even know you and you don't even know them Whoa. yet. Like, you know what I mean? Like just the idea of someone, you know, like, Chill. Uh, yeah, like some, there's going to be a social media app after TikTok 10 years from now, that's going to completely change somebody's life and give them freedom, like a Risa Tisa or right. a Emma Chamberlain or and a, maybe a music artist or something yeah. like they don't even know what that thing is yet, but right now there's somebody like writing the code for it. Wow. You know what I mean? I was in like, a dorm room an, somewhere. Yeah. And I was like, that's such an interesting like wow. thing to think about life too, of like you how never it's, know. It, it, yeah. Like P, uh, the universe is moving the same at the same rate you're moving. Yeah. You just don't feel it that way. And that other people are also building these things that will one day come and yeah. like add, add to your story as well. And you just have to keep showing up because exactly. you never know. And one of my favorite, um, sayings 
it's like an old like Chinese proverb and it's, um, I hope I don't butcher it, but it's like, um, nature is never in a rush and yet it's always on time. And it's just like the universe, like you don't have, like if you don't have to rush things like, um, and I, and that leads me now to the next topic, which is Tara Yummy, which is she's okay. So I'm going to go into a few details here because First off, I was on a music video set this weekend and someone came up to me and they go, Coco, I was listening to Trevi Moran and Tara Yummy's, like her interview with Tara Yummy. And in the first few seconds, they brought up you and Nikki and your podcast. And like the quote, it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. And I was like, whoa. And so Tara, okay, you guys know my lore. I worked at Famous Birthdays. All Do all roads lead to Famous Birthdays? Literally. Do they? They, it's the center of the universe. It is the it is a influencer factory. Like you go in, there's like doom, 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 like robots come out and they're the next like biggest influencer. Yeah. But no, it is when I worked at Famous Birthdays in 2019, I was the person who like sat near the door. So even if I was like lower on like <laughs> the employee, like I didn't have a lot of responsibilities at that time. And so I was like just there to greet people and then they would go other people would go and produce videos with them, but I would see them come in and I would say bye to them. There was a day where this YouTuber guy named Jake Weber came in Mm -hmm. with his new girlfriend, Tara Yummy. And I'm going to put in a photo, you guys. They were like, not emo like they are now. And like, I think (laughs) that Jake Weber always kind of was, but like, I didn't have their lore and like context in mind. So I just saw these two preppy, it's so preppy in here, like walk in and they were a couple and I was like, that's kind of cool. Like I remembered their names like Jake Weber and Tara Yummy stood out to me. Mm-hmm. They posted their first video together in um, April of 2019. And Jake Weber had been making videos for almost like 10 years. Oh, wow. So he was friends with like Sam and Colby, um, like those those people. He went way back on YouTube. Again, takes 10 years to be an overnight success. And they like... Tara Yummy has been doing like the circuit of podcasts. She's on a press tour. Yeah. And she was saying like, everyone asked her like, why do you think you started blowing up recently? And she's like, I don't know. I think I know. Here's my theory. Her and Jake Weber posted their breakup video six Mm -hmm. months ago. And I think that like, it was the same exact moment as like when David Dobrik and Liza Koshy. I was exactly going to make that comparison too. Like, I think there's just something about that where it was like, it transcends their audience almost. Yeah. I mean, I think I, you can call it like, I call it the one direction effect, almost like the biggest thing about the biggest power about creating like a group is when it breaks up. Yes. Like that is eternally going to be the most Mm -hmm. viral, the most talked about, like of anything is like, you know, one, when one direction broke up, like even people who didn't listen to one direction knew that. Yeah. And I think something like that, like you're saying like David Dobrik and Liza Koshy or something like that. Like there is this fascination. Yeah. This fascination of like, well, what happened? Why? Like, and, and people then go seek out that content to answer those questions. Yes. They start watching the videos more to see like where their micro expressions. And and then for the, the true fans that already exist, they're watching those interviews and stuff to be like, well, how do I get more info on like what happened here? How do I learn more about the relationship yeah. how do I learn so it's like it, it can bring in this new fandom and still like fuel the fires of these people who are already there yes and I think like um recent controversy aside I really do think that their dynamic reminds me of like a modern day like Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher both of them kind of look similar very emo a girl on TikTok even described they're like who's this Tara yummy girl and like why is she an emo like Mila Kunis like <laughs> and And a few other, like I watched their videos on YouTube. They obviously just have this really like admiration for each other and even their breakup video, like they're still friends. And I think that's really cool. And there's even like, um, audio is going viral about Tara and from Tara. One of them was in the breakup. Jake Weber says like, you're fucking Tara yummy. Like you're that, like you've always been her, like you're confident and that's going viral. And then there's Uh another thing going viral where Tara yummy is doing her like gothic makeup, emo makeup. And she goes, um, it, the sentence in the beginning is like, the first way to look like Tara Yummy is to think like Tara Yummy. Tara Yummy is a mindset. And like <laughs> that's going viral. And then I looked up. So, I love that. Yeah. So the founder of Famous Birthdays, Evan, my literal mentor, were um, like connected on LinkedIn and he'll post I every saw, now and it then. It was so interesting. Yes. So if you guys don't know the way Famous Birthdays works is it ranks people based on how often they're being searched and how often even like 
they're searched on Google and then it feeds into famous birthdays. There's a whole science behind it that's fascinating. And Tara Yummy is now trending so high on famous birthdays. She is at the number five spot on famous birthdays. Here are the people in front of her. It goes Taylor Swift, Charlie D'Amelio, Ariana Grande, Justin Bieber, Tara Yummy. It is <laughs> so hard. As someone who worked there, it is so hard to break into even the top like 100. Wow. Some celebrities who are under her in ranking, guys, this is not handpicked by anyone in the office. It is okay. based on searches. Mr. Beast is under her. Whoa. Olivia Rodrigo. Whoa. Ice Spice, Jenna Ortega. She's ranking higher than all of those people. Whoa. Also, go search Coco Mocha on famous birthdays. Give me a boost. <laughs> um, and Jake Weber as well has jumped up to spot number 19 on the list. And she even said in her canceled podcast with Tana Mojo that Jake taught her everything she knows about YouTube. He taught her thumbnails. He taught her editing. And she learned discipline from him. She has not missed a Monday upload in over two years. Good for her. And it really is like, she's like, I don't know why this is happening. Like I'm doing what I've always been doing. And I think it is just that like consistency. Yeah, it is that consistency. And I think like, I don't know, stories like that. I think people like start to see the humanity in them. Yeah, like they root for them. So anyways, um, we say that to say like, we got the shout out in the Trevi podcast. Thank you, Trevi. Um, Tara Yummy, if you want to come on, Trevi also, Please. we'd love to. Trevi, Tara, we, but we want to do like a rise of Tara Yummy, but I was like, why don't we just invite her on the podcast? In it would be so our, fascinating. We'd love to document your story. Yes. And we film sometimes at a studio by the Grove. So it's like nearby in LA. So like we can do it. We can do it. And then I just wanted to, one last thing. And then if you have anything, um, I wanted to talk about this one guy on Love is Blind that like, I okay because we talked about the Apple Watch thing last time and it did it really is. well on TikTok and yep. I felt like I had to just make yep. one more note. There was a guy on Love Is Blind who told his fiance that he couldn't say "I love you" because he ate too many taquitos <laughs> at the beach <laughs> and he bit the inside of his lip. Okay, so that was already like, huh, that's weird. The, okay, and me and you were talking about this off camera, so we'll go like kind of into it. Was it not so bizarre? So uh, in Love Is Blind, you guys, they introduce people to their like friends and family. Yeah. Mind you, it's people they've known for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. This guy introduces his fiance to mm -hmm. these like two young, attractive Girls. women. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, maybe they're like sisters. Maybe they're friends. They've only known each other for two years. And I'm like, okay, okay. it does. He not have like anyone else introduced. It comes out later. He was hooking up with one of the girls. Of course. I knew it from the moment they sat down. You think so? It, oh yeah. Why do you think he introduced her? Uh, Why? Because he's crazy and people like the competition. People yeah. love to feel like a prize. It's it, literally what it is. It was so bizarre. And then what really got me is, and like she obviously has her own issues and stuff, like it's clingy, but what really freaking got me is they get into a fight and he's like, you, I told you not to bring up that fact about my friend on camera. Like I told you off camera that I'd been hooking up with her. And then you brought it up during a fight on camera mm -hmm. and you humiliated her. You hurt her reputation on national TV. Why did you bring her onto the show in the first place? Why did you have her sign That's a disclosure agreement so to real. show her face and her name on the show just to then be hooking up with her? Yeah. It's and like you're opening that door. Yes. You, you were the one who brought her on TV. Correct. And you were hooking up with her. Why would you even introduce her? Like, it's like they were like hard launching their relationship on Love is Blind. But like that was, <laughs> uh, it was just bizarre. What are your thoughts on the show right now? I don't know. It's getting kind of boring at the Me end, too. honestly. But yeah. like, I just think we talked about this. Like maybe the magic's gone. I think the Love is Blind magic is gone. Like, I think a part of it was like, there was nothing to gain from it in the beginning. So yeah. these people really had to go into it with a certain amount of like, well, I'm taking a Earnestness. risk. Yeah. yeah. But also, I don't know. I've been saying this. Like, I could never imagine falling in love. Like, truly in love. Real love. With somebody that you have never seen interact in the world. Like, I need to know how they are with their boss yeah. and their career and their ambitions. Yes. I need to know how they treat, like, an Uber driver I know. or a waiter. After a long, I stressful need to, night. Yeah. Like, I need to know how, what their ma manners are. How they treat their mother. Like, yeah. there's just so much that is so important. And... No, I, like, I think it's like a fun television concept. Do I think like real true love can stem from that uh, outside of like sheer variance and luck that like two yeah. people really, really hit it off? Like, no, I think it's like, 
it, it's just you fall in love with the idea of it. It's literally the definition. Love is blind is the definition of falling in love with the idea of someone. Yes. Like that's just what it is. It's like, can you paint a perfect picture of this version? Can you paint a perfect version of this person in your head? Yeah. And then can you fall in love with that idea? And if so, like you'll, you'll you'll make it to the end and then be sadly disappointed when you're divorced in six months. I know. Or you very quickly all... take them for what they are and you don't and partake in the experiment or whatever. Yeah, it's just like an influencer factory now. And I've even, I talked to a lady who manages some people who've been on shows like that and they don't, they stop making good money after like a year or so after their shows have been out. So it's like people go on there, embarrass themselves. Right. It's, and like, then... it's like Harry Jowsey did it. And then everybody's like, <laughs> the this blueprint. is the way. Yes. And it's like, I don't think yes. so. Um, amazing. Do you have any other last thoughts? I feel I like talked so much this one. No, but... I, I, I like it when this happens. Sometimes okay. one of us just gets really passionate and I I'm like, you go girl. Yes. Um, I, the only thing I wanted to talk about, cause I was, we're talking about this off camera too, is like, the unfair treatment of Rachel Ziegler and how she was accused of like not caring about her character when Dakota Johnson is like outwardly shaming Madam mm -hmm. Webb, saying things like, I don't quote, I don't know if this is going to be good at all. On SNL, she described the movie as if AI made a movie for your boyfriend. When she was interviewed after how badly the movie performed, she said she was not surprised and described the filming experience as absolutely psychotic. Yeah. And people love it. <laughs> they love that she's like making fun of this movie. But when Rachel Ziegler did it for like she said, quote, this is when she got canceled. She's not going to be saved by the prince and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. And the leader, her late father, told her that she could be if she fearless, if she was fearless, fair, brave, and true. That was what she said about Snow White. Yeah. And got canceled for it. And I was like, I mean, I think what people are mad about is that she's saying that she's not going to be saved by the princess and not be dreaming about true love. But, like, that's not, like, not, derogatory yeah. Yeah. of the film. Like, it's just saying that they're, like, adding an element to yeah. her having, like, some semblance of independence a as a character. Yeah. And... I don't know. Like, I just thought there was such a concrete example of, like, when it's a white woman playing right. a white character. She's quirky. Yeah, it's, like, quirky and funny. And when it's a POC woman getting cast to play a white character, it's, like, how dare you not honor this correctly? Yes. Yes. Or not, you know, be appreciative of the role. And, like, I think that's a huge element of it. I also think, too, there's this weird, like, infantilization of Disney. It's yeah. like because everybody has a it's so deeply rooted associated with like the childhood yes. of generations worth of people that they are like freaking out about it. But I don't know. It's just bizarre to me. They associate it with the status quo and like they yeah. want it to look a certain way. But the status quo is meant to be, that was never even the status just, quo yeah. when they were making the yeah. movies. It's just what was getting yeah, like filmed. Like, like that's, that's never been the status quo. It's just like yeah. what was allowed. Yeah. It's that's a good. Well, yeah. We'll end we'll on, that. on that. We'll end on thank, that. Yes. Thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, like, comment, subscribe, Discord. Go check out the Spotify episode part yes. one. If you've already seen it, go give it a like. Don't forget yes. to subscribe. We love you. Bye. See you next week.